You are listening to Meet the Thriller Author. I am your host, Alan Peterson, and each episode of this podcast will introduce you to a new author in the thriller, mystery, and suspense genres. As a reader, I've been a fan of those uh, type of books for a very long time, and that is why I write in that uh, genre now, and so I'm excited to introduce you to new authors. Discovering uh, new books and authors is uh, such a fun thing to do, and uh, that's what I hope to do with these uh, interviews. So stay tuned for the next episode of Meet the Thriller Author. Hey everybody, this is Alan Peterson with Meet the Thriller Author. And for uh, this episode, I have a uh, best-selling and award-winning writer, John D. Brown. And uh, excited to have him uh, on the uh, show for this uh, podcast. Uh, John, how are you doing? Great. Glad to be here. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Yeah, sure. So I debuted with Tor Books with Epic Fantasy. And while they were... Working with my second novel, I wrote a, a thriller. I'd always loved thrillers, wanted to write one, and thought I had a great concept for one, and so um, turned my attention to that. And when I talked to my agent about that and what we were probably likely to get from New York as a new thriller author, I and you know this is all the time when the indie publishing thing was just getting hot, and so I. I looked at what New York was likely going to do, and I decided to go indie with these. And so uh, that's what we've done. And so I've got uh, some thrillers out and then some epic fantasy. Yeah, I noticed your uh, your fantasy. Do you see it? Is there a big difference between writing a thriller and a fantasy, or can you like go back and forth pretty easily now, the two? With an epic fantasy, usually these are large books with a large cast of characters and a lot of different storylines. And, and then, of course, you've got the whole world-building aspect. And so there's a lot of work. I mean, it's not that thrillers, there isn't work that goes into thrillers, but there's a lot of work that goes into, at least for me, creating the fantasy world and then braiding all these storylines and then just this, this simple size. So, for example, when I, my first epic fantasy, it, clocked in at about 180,000 words. Oh, wow. And then, yeah, and so then the next one was 230, 240 when I was writing the, the draft of the, of the second book. And, and so compare that to the thriller, and then it's got a cast of just tons of people, and I've got six or seven storylines going at the same time. Compare that to my thriller, which is, you know, I've got a cast of maybe six main people. Of course, they're secondary characters. But, you know, I've got this very small cast, and uh, most of it is just one point of view, and it's one event, you know, one main event, one main storyline. There are a couple of other little storylines, but one main storyline. So it's like a, it's just like a straight shot, boom, you know, it's just... When, when you compare it to those monsters, it was, I got to that and I was like, wow, that was, that was a lot simpler. So <laughs> you're like, that wasn't bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah I, so, still, still work, still work, mm-hmm. but, but definitely not that sprawling, sprawling thing that you have with epic fantasy. Yeah. I could, uh, I don't think I would be able to be able to write fantasy. And I, I've tried to read it before, but like you said, it's so, like you said, it's so spiraling. It's just too, that's why I'm more of a action thriller type, uh, type fan, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I read your, I read bad penny. That's how I, I first found out about you. I love your covers by the way. And, uh, oh, yeah. and yeah, that bad penny was this, uh, I haven't read awful intent yet, but bad penny was like, uh, a uh, lot of action nonstop, uh, it, was, it was a it was a lot it was a, a lot a fun read for sure. Yeah, I had a good time with Bad Penny. Yeah, but how many so how many words did those clock in at? Uh, I think Bad Penny is, I think that one's 120, and I think Awful Intent is 110 ish somewhere around there. I'd, I'd have to look it up, but I think that's they're in that ballpark. And so you can are you continuing to write in the Frank Shaw's world? Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm definitely, I've got another one on the docket. Uh, the working title right now is called Gray Hat. And in this one, Frank goes down to, he's got a nephew that you saw in Bad Penny, Tony. Um, that's a kind of a hacker, a white hat, gray hat hacker. And Tony gets involved in some stuff through that. And that's the next one. So, And uh, so how long have you been writing for? I've been writing for a long time. I was, uh, I decided to start writing back in 
in the year of our Lord, 1987, <laughs> back, back in the old days, uh, I was sitting in trying to figure out what I wanted to do, what I wanted to major in in, in college. And I was in this honors class that that uh, satisfied a lot of the general requirements. And towards the end of that year, they read a, a quote from Emily Dickinson. And she said that poetry felt like the top of your head was being taken off. That's that's how she described it. And I just thought right there, you know what? That's I, I want to take the tops of people's heads off. That's what I want to do. I want to write. And so I got into the the English literature program thinking that I would learn how to tell stories there. And, you know, that was I – mean, there were creative writing classes and that, but, but English literature is not really storytelling and – and certainly not commercial storytelling. So it took a little while, but but I've been writing since that time. I won an award, uh, Writers of the Future Award, back in 97. And uh, that was the first published sale, a couple thousand dollars in money. They flew us out to Cocoa Beach, Florida for a week-long workshop with professional authors. So that was kind of the beginning, kind of the beginning there. So been been at it for a while. Yeah, and uh, how many books do you have post now so far? So I, I've got five out, five oh. out, I've written 10, and um, we're just continuing on. I've got a new, I've got the Bad Penny, the, the Frank Shaw thriller series, I've got my epic fantasy, and I've got another another series that I'm going to be releasing here shortly. These will be shorter books. It's going to be uh, more of a young adult fantasy thing. Epic fantasy, but for young adults. Uh, some things that are new that... I don't see out there right now, but so I think it's gonna. I don't know. We'll see. I think it's gonna go well. And are you still are your fantasy? Are you still post? Are you still going with uh, Tor as, as your publisher? Uh, no, with Tor we we you know you get a you get a your your traditional publishing contract. You get accepted by an agent. You get accepted by a publisher, and and you know it's like strapping yourself in a rocket ship to the moon, right? <laughs> but with my my rocket ship kind of uh, slid over to the side and, and blasted off into the swamp. And, uh, and that might be overstating it. Uh, basically what happened is, if, if you think about the root of it, my publisher and I, the editor, we, we just didn't see eye to eye on the story itself. There were some things that I was interested in and things that I wanted to tell. There were things that they were interested in. And it just, we just didn't, you know, see eye to eye and it's a business partnership. And so, you know, there are no hard feelings. I learned a lot from the great people at Tor. had a great time there. I was happy to have the contract that I had with them, but, but it just, um, it was a business deal that, uh, just didn't work out. So, uh, and then the indie thing came along and I figured that I could, I could do that. And I'm, I'm more interested in that right now. There's some of the contract terms that you get from traditional publishers that I'm just not willing to sign on for at, at this current time. Yeah, it is incredible, the, the changes in the last 10 years in the publishing world. <laughs> it's a lot yeah. more freedom now. Yeah, that's for sure. So when you're writing your Frank Shaw books, uh, where do you get your ideas? Well, so for me, ideas come from a lot of different places. So there are ideas that just kind of fall in your lap. You know, I, I call them zing. They're little electrical jolts, jolts, and it might be a conversation that I overhear in a in a, in a store or something, or a, a character that I might meet. Uh, so, and I, by that I mean a character, like a living person, somebody that's a real character. So it might be something like that, or there might be a TV show that I watch, or something that I'm reading. Uh, you know, maybe I've got a book about Afghanistan and I read something there. So there are a million different places where you might get ideas that just kind of fall into your lap. But I, what I find is that the, the, those are not – you don't have a story yet. You just have, you just have a, an interesting idea. You know, if you look at a story as character setting, problem, plot, then I might have a little nice little – zinging electrical piece of setting or or a character or a snippet of a conversation so so i will get those all over the place uh through just just normal course of the day and researching and reading and all that kind of stuff but then you've got to develop ideas 
And so you got to develop them into a story, and a story requires a certain uh, s- certain number of things, right? And f- for example, I just gave a presentation at a Romance Writers of America uh, annual conference, not their not their big one, but a chapter conference up in Utah, and and I talk about that. You know, there's there's this thing that I call the story setup, and so you've got to have these certain elements, and when you've got that, now you've got an engine. That can, that can propel the the story vehicle. But until you have that, you you really don't have a story. So along with these passive things like a dragnet that you've got out there, and you're just collecting zing as it comes to you, I I use various methods to to generate the story ideas from those those things that are that are drawing me, that are sparking my interest. Yeah, I noticed that on your website you have these uh, progress meters, and I saw I said. You had like 0.5 of three story elements. So that's the story elements that you're hitting when you're in the drafting mode before you actually get to the writing? Yeah, so I have a, I kind of break out my development into the pre draft work. And I know that I'm ready to go to start drafting. And then, and then the other is the draft, right? So I, I do pre draft where I'm developing the idea and sketching the idea out. And then after I've got, uh, a working outline, then I'm ready to to do my drafting. And well, by a working outline, it's not a necessarily a super detailed thing. It's a beat sheet. It's a sketch. And I like to use that term of sketching and drafting. Because sketching is not, you know, if you're an artist and you're sketching, you're sketching, right? It's loose. It's free. It's it's easy to move around. It's not like filling out forms or anything like that. And so, what I found for a story. Before I can write it, is I need to have, I need to have a sketch of an interesting character or a set of characters actually. But I've got to definitely have whoever the main character is. I need a, a sketch of that character, and then I need to have um, that that character needs something specific that he or she needs to gain or retain, and the thing that triggers that. Uh, the thing that triggers that is, and I break it down, I call it a, a Tomer, T-H-O-M-R, so you might you know, remember that by thinking Tom Rogers or something like that. But, but it's, these, it's this thing that, that, that triggers the desire to gain or retain something. So that Tomer might be a threat, a hardship, an opportunity, a mystery, or a relationship. And, and, and so I've got to have that interesting character. I've got to have a Tomer that then helps me figure out, you know, a very specific thing that that character wants to gain or retain. And then the last thing that I need for the story setup, well, I probably need two more things. The next thing is I've got to have s- some type of formidable obstacle and, and, and potentially other obstacles that that character is going to meet in the effort to gain or retain that thing, whatever that is, right? Mm-hmm. I need to have some type of an obstacle. If I don't have that, if I don't have those three things that I just talked to you about, you don't, you, you can't trigger in the reader the kind of uh, emotions, the experience that they go to, um, they go to story for, they go to fiction for. So I've got to have that. And then the other thing is the inciting incident, which is, you know, how does the, how does the Tomer arise and, and generate that that desire to gain or retain something in the character? And so I get those those three things. I develop those three things. And, of course, I'm sketching things about the setting and researching about the setting or researching about all sorts of stuff. I'm doing all these sketches. And then once I've got that story set up, uh, and, and usually I've, I've got a, a good sketch of the character and where they're going to be, you know, like for Awful Intent... Uh, it was going to be set in southern Utah. And so I went down to southern Utah. I've been there before, love it, but I went down specifically for research to to start mapping things out, get a little bit better lay of the land and, and figure out exactly where I wanted this story to take place and see how things were down there, talk to people down there, um, you know, with, with some of the questions that I had. So So I'll do all that background work. And it's not all the work that I'll do. You develop, at least I've found, and maybe you've found the same as you, right? I develop until I type the end, mm. right? But but this pre-draft stuff is getting a lot of the initial stuff together. So so I get that, and then I, I do my working outline, 
which says, okay, here's this, here's this Tomer that sparked this desire to gain or retain something. And how, how does it play out? Right. What are the big events that I see all the way to the end? And I guess along with that, there's one other thing. I know I'm talking long here, but I figured I'd, I'd get it to you. The other thing that I see, especially those the folks that are listening, I know if you're a new writer, sometimes you don't quite know where to, where to start, where to begin. The other thing that I do as part of the pre-draft is, uh, you know, every one of these genres that we write have the – there are things that the we're taking the readers for a ride is basically what we're doing. It's like a roller coaster. It's a ride. We're taking them on this guided experience. And, and so they're coming to us saying, you know what? Uh, it's a thriller and it's an action thriller. At least that's what I'm writing with the Frank Shaw series. Uh, what are some of the, the wonderful things that they anticipate? The cool things, the draws, the, uh, the buttons that they love to have pushed in those. And, and as you know, you know, some of that's, uh, there's chases and action stunts and, and all that kind of stuff, funny characters, interesting characters. And so part of the initial pre-draft sketching that I do is I look at that and I identify those things. And of course, I have my own things that I want to put in that I think are interesting. And so I'll sketch some of those items. And all of that goes into, you know, so I've got a working outline. I kind of have a, a controlling idea for the story. I've got my story set up. I've got all that sketches. And as soon as I've done that, then it's time to start drafting. And then I continue on there, right? Every chapter, I'm still going to be developing stuff because you can't think of everything beforehand. So so when you ask, where do you get your ideas? And you ask, where do you get your ideas? It's not uh, a single place. It's not a single activity. It's a process. It's a process that I go through and it continues on until I type the end. If you're if you're getting all these uh, these elements in order, and you're getting your 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 uh, your draft in order, your outline in order. Do you ever get to a point where you have an idea and you think it's a great idea, but it just doesn't go anywhere, and then you're like, oh, I move on to the next thing? Well, so this goes back to the the initial the initial question. There, the, a story for me isn't an idea. A story for me is. Uh, I've got to have a story set up. You got to have an interesting character. You've got to have something that they have to gain or retain. You got to have obstacles and I've got to have things in each of those categories that are jazzing me that, that sparked my interest. And so, so, so I'm going to start with, it's like a, uh, there was a, another author. I can't remember his name or maybe I was it Swain. I can't remember. Anyway, he compared it to a snowball and and that a story is a bunch of ideas that that build by accretion, right? It's like a snowball. It's a, a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here, a little bit there. And, it, and what I have found is that I can take, I can start with kind of a, not very much of an idea, just a little spark. And by going through the developmental process, I can develop that into something that I'm like, I'm stoked about, right? And I've got, I feel like I've got, something alive and kicking in my hands. I'm full of electricity. So, so it's, so either I get it to that point, I either develop it to that point where I'm ready to go or, or I'm not to that point. And if I'm not to that point, I'm not going to write. Do you see what I'm saying? So for me, it's, but for me, it's this, this idea is developed to the point where I can write it or it's not. Now, sometimes like, uh, with awful intent, I thought I had, I had an actual working outline and I was ready to go. I loved it. I had everything sketched out. I was ready to go. And I started writing it. And I got maybe three chapters in, maybe, or somewhere around there. And I realized that I had imagined, uh, you know, when I did my outline, I had imagined a motive. I had imagined that the sheriff, it's a female sheriff that's working with Frank. Frank's an ex-con. He's an ex ex military uh, special forces operator, so I had imagined because I thought it was cool, it was fun that she would behave a certain way. But when I got into it and I started doing this, I started to realize no, no, she's not going to behave that way. That I am. That's just not going to happen. She, I can't. I can't figure out a way. I can't figure out a motivation or, or a, a situation that would allow her to behave that way. And so as soon as that happened. That, that electricity, the, the, the electricity got turned off, right? And I knew 
okay, scrap all these three chapters, scrap this original sketches. I've got to kind of go back on her and figure her out. And some of the scenes that I thought were going to be great, they're not there anymore. You, you see what I'm saying? And so I, I have to go back then and say, no, nope, let's go back to the development board. I, I identified this problem. And, and that's not a bad thing because, because you cannot foresee, I know there are writers and I know when I first was writing, you know, you, you, it was almost like the, the metaphor was you're going to r- create a blueprint and then you'll just write to the blueprint. Any monkey can, can build the house after that. But what I found is that for me, at least writing doesn't work that way. I create a sketch, but I cannot foresee it's impossible to foresee. I'm, I'm heading out into new territory. And even though I kind of have an idea of where I'm going, and even though I have a, an outline, I cannot foresee everything that's out there. I cannot think everything through. And so I'm always developing. I'm always having to change those sketches. Um, although the bulk of that happens in the pre-draft mode and when I'm doing my first few chapters. By the time I get to the middle and at end of the book, I'm really focused on just developing the scenes that are right in front of me. I've usually worked out all the other kinks so i i don't know hopefully that that answers that question yeah absolutely absolutely thank you no it's a good uh, good tips too <laughs> and uh, what uh, what do you use uh, uh, for writing and research do you use, do you use like word or you use like one of the so- uh, writing softwares that are out there in the market uh just word i use word and i use a number of documents i'm sure everybody tells me about uh, Scrivener, right <laughs> yeah i think that's the one yeah, yeah. that's the, that's yeah, the popular one i think that's <laughs> I'm like, ah, I should probably look at it, but you know, I'm just too, I just got to get crap done. And so I haven't taken time to, to look at it, to see if that's something that's going to work for me. But yeah. And there is a big learning curve with uh, Scrivener too, which I, a lot of people are like, Oh, forget it. I'm going back to word. So <laughs> it's whatever works. And, um, do you find like, a, does your personality or like people, you know, do, I mean, do, do, does that make it into your books or into like Frank Shaw? Yeah. All the time. Yeah, I can't, right? That's that's who I know. So I'll find somebody funny and I'll think about them and I'll say, you know what, I'm going to put them in there. I'm going to change a number of things about them so that I don't I don't think of that person specifically or, or maybe, let me, let me reset, so that I don't feel like I have to write that person. I can write somebody different, but they maybe they have the personality or maybe they've got their, their statue or a statue or something like that. And, and my personality goes in there, of course, right? I mean, I... I don't want to make every one of my characters me. I don't do that. But but I have a certain sense of humor and I have a certain way of looking at the world and so I can't, you know what I'm saying? I when I'm mm-hmm. I, I try to r- role play. I try to play every character's role and try to say, well, okay, what would this guy do in this one? What would he do? But it's still my thoughts. It's still do you do you know what I'm saying? It's still my answers to those questions. So for, uh, I'll just give you a, an example. In in the epic fantasy, I have this 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 monster, this creature, this beast. He's terrible. He's absolutely terrible. Um, so I I hope I wouldn't want to be, you know, that isn't me. But when I write him, I'm trying to get into his skin and saying, okay, if this were my situation, what would I do? If I was like this person and I had these thoughts and values, what would I do? And so in that sense of the word, yeah, it's always for me, it's always, it's always my thoughts and my, my stuff. Is that kind of, is that what you're asking? Is that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, yeah, exactly that. Yeah. I'm always curious as to how much, and, and almost everyone has always said the same thing. And I'm the same way too. When I write that, yeah, our personalities, no matter how, or what we try to do, they always end up making it into the, into our books, into the characters. Ah. Yeah. At least a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that's that's yeah. And my like my daughters, they'll read my books and they'll say, Oh, I can hear you know, nobody else says this, but my daughter's like, I can hear you. I mean and there in fact there are little phrases that I use with them and those will get you know, those will be in the book. So people that know me super well, they'll they'll be able to say, Oh, that's John right there. You know? <laughs> and uh, do, when you, do you write every day? I try. I try to write every day. Well, not every day. I try to write six days a week. So right now I, I try to, during my lunch hour, it's, I've got an hour to write then. And then from, from, uh, from nine thirty to 11 in the evening, I try to get some time there. Cause I've got, a, I'm still working full time as a, at a day job and then Friday mornings early and Saturdays. All right. 
And so that's that's what I try to do. Try to get somewhere between 15 to 20 hours a week. And uh, do you still find uh, time uh, to read? Uh, do, or do you read thrillers still? Or Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. read. I got got to read. I read, yeah, I I read nonfiction. Got to read nonfiction because I love it and because I need to do research into the thrillers. And I love, I still love reading. It's, of course, not, you know, if I wasn't, writing for 20 hours uh or 15 hours a week i could do a heck of a lot more reading but but yeah yeah and that's it. people say that uh, i've had some other uh, authors that i've interviewed that they don't like to read within their same genre because they don't want to get influenced but i i like I, i've always liked reading thrillers and action books so I, I i can't stop uh do you find that do you worry about that or oh i love reading yeah. oh, wow. Why would I want to give up? Okay, I, I don't know about exactly. that. But it's like, why, we're on the same page. Why would I want to give up Lee Child, right? Why would yeah, I yeah exactly. To write my own stories. I I love these stories. And and the cool thing about reading other people is I'm learning from them, right? I see mm-hmm. things that they do that I'm like, ah, I'm not going to do that. Or I see other things that I that they do and I'm like, I love that. Well, what did they do? How did they do that? I'm going to figure that out because I want to – I want to use that in one of my books, right? So I, I, I love it. There's no way I wouldn't read in the genre I'm writing in. So, and what were some of the writers that in, inspired you uh, when when it came to writing thrillers? Uh, th- well, I love I love Lee Child's mm-hmm. stuff. I love his Jack Reacher's. You know, there was John Corey. Nelson DeMille did did um, some John Corey books with this this terrorist from back from from the middle east and he was just this wise crack and you know th- these are all in the if you look at thrillers there's all sorts of different kinds of thrillers and one of the subgenres is the lone ranger you know vigilante that goes out and kicks butt right and and so and you've got these guys that are kind of going outside the law to to get to to serve justice and remove the danger and so I really like that, you know. And then there are others. There are other. I don't know. There's just too many. I just. It's like my kids ask me what my favorite color is, and I'm like, I I love them all. I don't know. I like all, a lot of colors. So I like a lot. So I just. I guess I'll leave it with that. You know. You well, and I guess you know. You look at movies too. I I look at uh, Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock Holmes, the 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 two movies that he did. Mm-hmm. In my book, those are thrillers. Oh, yeah. Total thrillers, right? Iron Man one, that's thriller, right? So all of these, uh, you know, with Robert Dan- and I love him as an actor. And Iron Man, th- I, I look at those; those to me are thrillers. So Dean Koontz has another one, The Good Guy and the Husband. Oh, the Good Guy is such a great book, right? It's such a great book. Um, another one in this uh, this series, so uh, or this this type of a uh, thriller. So I just there's a lot of them that I love. And would, where, where do you usually write? Do you have like a specific area assigned in your house? Like a yeah, I have a I have a home office, and so you know I do a lot of my my day job is online, and so I work I work there for that, and then and then it just depends if so uh, my daughters were big into volleyball and basketball, and and we live in a small rural community, and what that means in Utah is that sometimes we might have to drive couple hours to get to our game and then you stay you might stay for a while because you know they're they're going to be playing maybe in the seventh grade team and the eighth grade team or whatever and so if i have to i'll i'll develop on the way and or i'll i'll find a a a quiet i remember once it was uh, a volleyball game and i was trying to so i would go down in the gym it was this round gym it was like this geo it's like those, what do they call those, geodesic domes or however you say that? It was this round gym. It was round. And so I would go around in a corner and I would write, uh, you know, so the volleyball game was going there and I would write. And then when my daughter's game, it was her time to play, I'd unplug from the plug in the wall and come come back out from my little cubby hole back there and go up into the bleachers and watch. So it just depends. It just depends. I, I wrote one novel, a lot of that, in the lobby of a medical clinic, you know, because that's where I could go on my lunch break, and it was, it was really hot and muggy outside. It was during the summer, and so I would just go there, and they let me hang out there. Nobody cared because it was a huge <laughs> lobby, and 
and I never got sick, so that was good. <laughs> right there. So just kind of depends. But most of it's in my office. And do you need silence, or do you have like music blasting? Uh, I need to get into the flow. I usually don't do a lot of music because I get too distracted by it. Um, so I do need to get into the flow. But if it's just background noise, then that's not a problem. Like in the, you know, like in the gym or whatever, I can kind of tune that kind of stuff out if I need to. What are some of the challenges that you find when you're when you're writing? Well, an, a, originally, initially. I didn't know what the heck I was doing, <laughs> right? You, back when I started, and, and maybe it's maybe it's still the same for a lot of people, but there's not a lot of good. How am I going to say this? It's not like you can go to any university and or any technical school and learn, you know, electrical work or plumbing or or um, something else. Uh, it, it, and so it was kind of hard to it was kind of hard to figure out what was really at what was really the heart of the story and what made him tick and and uh, you know what did uh, when you got writer's block it used to be that that was a tragedy right it was like oh my god no but for me now it's like oh this is what this is telling me great I'm glad I had that so so initially it was I didn't know what the heck I was doing now it's time. Time, 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 time. That is my biggest thing is finding the time. And I'm busy, 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 busy. And, and just making sure that I have time. That's the big problem. And when, you, when you're writing the two different uh, series, do you, like, uh, do you write one at a time? Or do you go back and forth between uh, different projects? Uh, so far, I've been going back and forth. Oh, but cool. uh, we'll, we'll see. This year, I hope to get a, um, a couple done in a row. We'll, we'll see how it works out. <laughs> When's the next? Uh, when do you think the next uh, um, Frank Shaw book is coming out? Uh, I'm targeting next spring. Okay, so we'll cool. see. My my targets are notoriously off, but I'm targeting <laughs> next sometime. Yeah, I learned that the hard way. I no longer say anything. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm way late, and people are asking me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm not going to keep you uh, to, too much longer here. Uh, final thoughts to our listeners uh, before uh, before I let you go, John. Well, tell me this: Are your listeners mostly thriller, thriller readers, or are they thriller writers? Actually, it's a little bit of both, and I, I get emails from uh, um, aspiring writers. So, um, you know, they're readers, and they're thinking about maybe writing, and they're getting excited about it, but they haven't really done it yet. Oh. So that's kind of like the mix that I've that that, that I would say it's uh, readers slash aspiring writers. Hmm. Well, okay, so for you folks. I would recommend that you read a couple of books. Because like I said, when I first started, the biggest block was not knowing what the heck I was doing. And and there's some good advice out there, and then there's some advice that's absolute junk um, that really doesn't help you at all. And so if if – so let me just give you a couple of titles that I found to be very insightful – and and helpful. So the first is Techniques of the Selling Writer by Dwight V. Swain. And I think that's a must-have book. Dwight uh, Dwight lays it out and, and does a great job. And uh, he was part of the Oklahoma Writing Program. And and this thing it was written, I think, in the late 60s. And it's been around since then. And it's been around since then because it's gold. It's absolute gold. So I would make sure that you... Read and understand that. Then uh, one of his students that went on to sell 80 novels, I think it was 80, 83, 80 novels, and a couple of them were made into movies is Jack Bickham. And he wrote a couple of books, writing and selling your novels, seeing a structure. I would read one of, one of those uh, to get, to get um, some background. Another one that I found helpful, and this is, more along the thriller lines, and that was The Secrets of Action Screenwriting by William C. Martell. And um, there are a couple of things in there that I don't know that I agree with, but he was, he, he's got just some awesome, awesome, awesome content in there. So there are three books. There, is, there are some others. Orson Cards, Characters, and Viewpoint is helpful. Uh, Blake Snyder's Save the Cat 
is helpful. Uh, David Howard's How to Build a Great Screenplay is helpful. Now, the thing with those is, you know, those are folks that are writing for film. Some of their things just absolutely don't apply at all to us when we're writing fiction, when we're writing text, because it's a different medium for telling the story. And so you have to just, you have to just remember that. But I, th- there, there are some good books there that if you haven't read those and, and really digested what they're having to say, I think you'll find uh, a lot of help in those, in those books. So I'll, I'll leave your listeners with that. Oh, that's wonderful. And, uh, Listeners, I'll have uh, links on the website to all these books too. So, uh, FYI, if, if you have, didn't write them down, and uh, and then John's uh, website too is at johndbrown.com, and I'll have a link for that as well. John, thank you so much for being on the show and providing such uh, awesome advice. I uh, really appreciate it, and looking forward to uh, your upcoming work. Yeah, you bet. Thank you for listening to this episode of Meet the Thriller Author. I'd like to ask you to please uh, rate and review this uh, podcast over on iTunes. It only takes a few seconds, and it really helps me get the word out about the podcast. I would really appreciate that. And you can visit my website at thrillingreads.com forward slash podcast. If you haven't subscribed yet, you can do so from there. Uh, You can do it on iTunes. You can do it with Stitcher. You can do it on Android. The RSS feed is there, so make it very easy for you to subscribe to this uh, podcast. And you can also join my mailing list uh, from the website. And I've actually been uh, getting some pretty cool offers uh, for listeners. So if you want to uh, get a great deal on a thrilling read, you can uh, join the mailing list over at thrillingreads.com forward slash podcast. And uh, you'll get a, I'll let you know about these uh, great offers that I've been receiving uh, that I can pass on to you and uh, please visit my website my author website over at alanpeterson.com and you can download my uh, best-selling thriller the asset for free from there thank you very much and until next time Mm